So many faces here at Somerset Hills Lutheran Church. Welcome and welcome to those on Zoom and Facebook Live. Uh, great to have you with us this Sunday morning. A few announcements before we start. The sign up for Step Out and Serve, a churchwide event for members and friends to serve others begins this week. An email will be sent on Tuesday with a list of sites and how to sign up. You may also sign up at the church beginning next Sunday. A Step Out and Serve t-shirt with our SHLC logo and web address is available for purchase to wear on the workday as a way to show our team spirit and to be a witness, but you are not required to purchase. The date to serve is Saturday, June 5th, and it will be starting at 9, uh, going through noon. There'll be two sites. One includes preparing sandwiches to, for those uh, to feed those in need. And uh, we'll also be setting up at a parking lot in Bernersville to work with uh, Camino de Fe to connect kids who are not in school to school resources. The sign up describes what jobs you can fill as a volunteer. Next, there will be a socially distanced junior and senior youth s'mores night Tonight, this Sunday, May 2nd, from 7 to 9 p.m. in the church parking lot. Feel free to stop by with, at whatever time you have, with whatever time you have, and remember to bring a chair, a mask, and marshmallows, uh, marshmallow roasting stick. We'll have the marshmallows, chocolate, and graham crackers. If you plan to attend, please RSVP to Rachel Richards, and that would be appreciated. Parents and adults are also welcome to attend S'mores Night. Bring your favorite beverage and a friend. Remember that's tonight from seven to nine. We'll sort of segregate everybody out. The kids over here, the adults over here. Um, let's see. Also, we have Favorite Song Sunday coming up this uh, May 23rd. You can submit your favorite hymns and songs by emailing your choices to Denise at Denise at shlc.net or writing them on a ballot available in the entrance table here at church. Let us know your most cherished hymns and songs. Two more to go. The annual congregation meeting will be held following worship on May 23rd. You may participate in person or via Zoom. And then nominations for open 2021 through 2023 Positions may be submitted to the nominations committee by next Sunday, May 9th. And then finally, who has allergies? It's a bad allergy season. And who's allergic to COVID-19? All right, we're gonna hear the good word where you don't have any allergies and will make us strong to fight them. Thank you. Well, good morning. Pastor John Trinkline. I get to be the intentional interim pastor here at Somerset Hills Lutheran Church, and we're having a lot of fun. And you know what? You just made a whole lot more fun. This is a great day today. Welcome to you who are here in person as we're going to celebrate a very special baptism. We're going to receive new members. It's a great day. Welcome to you who are with us via Zoom and on Facebook Live. We're so glad that you are here today. We're going to continue exactly, as a matter of fact, not just continue, we're going to finish a message on God's story of what he's doing in our world, and it's called Reset. Yeah, God's in the business of reclaiming what was lost, rebuilding what has been broken, and today we're going to learn that to get breakthrough, there's one more thing we need. We need to learn how to resist all the opposition and see him work in a powerful way. God will work in our lives today. I know that. He's already here. So let's stand together as we begin our worship. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. <clears throat> but if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just.
Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. We confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Hear the good news. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. I, therefore, as a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's give praise to the Lord our God. Invite the family sponsors to come forward. That's where that's fine. I'm there. Well, what a great day this is. And here's what I want to tell you. First of all, did you know God already knew about this day? He gave you your children so that you would bring them up in the knowledge of Him. That's an amazing thing. And you're being Faithful to what Jesus said. He said, make disciples of all people. Well, these are people right here. That he's given to you, and you baptize them. And so my prayer is as we have this great day. Yes. Allegra's already rejoicing, by the way. She is enjoying this. That God has promised to work in her life to give her new birth into the family of God. <clears throat> and uh, Annabelle and Elliot, you get to see this. Let me ask you. Annabelle, were you excited when this new baby came home? Oh, you were? I am so glad. Notice I didn't ask Elliot, but I think you would say you were excited, wouldn't you? All right. That's good. I want to tell you, God is even more excited. And it is my prayer that as we baptize today, as we do what Jesus tells us to do, may there never be a day that Allegra does not know God as her Heavenly Father, Jesus as her Savior, and the power of the Holy Spirit in her life. So today I'm going to ask um, you as sponsors, Domenico and Valeria, will you do all you can to encourage both John 
and Michelle, but especially Allegra, that as she grows up, that she would hear the word of the Lord, that she would know his love, and she would grow in her faith, doing what you can to pray for her, be there. If you're willing to do that, would you say, I will with the help of God? May God bless you in that good work that you will do. Well, at this time then, let me ask you this, and this is for all of us here, because God's working in her life, that means the devil has no right to her. So do you renounce the devil in all his works and all his ways? And everyone answer, I do renounce them. Do you believe in God the Father? Yes, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ, his only son? Yes, I believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, from thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. And do you believe in the Holy Spirit? Yes, I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Well, I think it's time to baptize. Allegra Flora Hill. I baptize you in the name of God the Father, in the name of God the Son, and in the name of God the Holy Spirit. May God Almighty, who has promised new birth through his word and through the power of his Holy Spirit, fill you and give you faith now and all the days of your life. Lord, we pray for you to keep her in your care. Watch over her, Lord. Bless mom and dad, brother and sister. Bless them, Lord God, as they continue to live their lives to your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I know that it looked incredibly simple. Water in the Word. But I will tell you, the power of God is what gives us new life. And through baptism, God has added Allegra to his own people to declare the wonderful deeds of our Savior who has called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. Will you, congregation, now welcome this new sister in the Lord into the family of God? Let's then respond. We welcome you to the Lord's family. We receive you as a fellow member of the body of Christ, a child of the same Heavenly Father, to be on a mission with us in his kingdom. And you, Allegra, may the Lord bless you in all your ways from this time forth and forever. Amen. Let's respond again with the song of praise. This time we will hear the word of the Lord.
<clears throat> the scripture reading is from 1 John chapter 4. Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. This is how you can recognize the spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges <clears throat> that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God, but every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming and even now is already in the world. You, dear children, are from God and have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. They are from the world and therefore speak from the viewpoint of the world and the world listens to them. We are from God and whoever knows God listens to us, but whoever is not from God does not listen to us. This is how we recognize the spirit of truth and the spirit of falsehood. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God shows his love among us. He sends his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not what we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The gospel reading is from John chapter 15. Please rise. I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are, not, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. This is the gospel of the Lord.
you and peace be unto you from God our Father and the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Well, today is the last message in the series called Reset. And we're learning that God's whole story leads all the way to a time where he reclaims what is lost, he rebuilds what is broken. Indeed, we've looked at four parts to this story very quickly. There's creation, where he gives us life, and that's what God intended for us. Did you know it was never God's desire or will that any of us would die? He didn't create us just to kind of struggle through life for 70, 80, 90 years and then just die. He created us to have a relationship with him, to walk with him day by day, to know the life that he gives. However, the second part of the story is the fall. It's where humanity said, no, we're going to do this on our own. We know better than God. And so they walked away from him, and death entered the world. That's the consequence. Separated from God, there's death. However, the good news is the redemption of our Lord. That's the third part of the story where Jesus came into the world, fulfilled the law for us, went to the cross, paid the debt of our sin, and gives us life eternal. And so the good news is that through his death and resurrection, we have forgiveness and we have life. But there's one more part of the story that many seem to miss. That is now the restoration to new life that God desires us to have. The gospel came to you, not to, for you to keep it. It's too good for you to keep. It came to you on the way to somebody else. And so you and I can be a part of what God is doing in this world. And the question is, are you going to be part of God's story, or are you still trying to write your own? Here's what I can tell you based on Scripture and based on life experience. The best life is where we are part of His story. There's fulfillment. There is joy in that. Because we get to make a difference in the world through the power of God at work in us. Every human being has it in their heart. They know that we are placed on this planet for more than just taking up space and sucking air. We know that there's a calling upon our life to do something more, something beyond ourselves. And we're right. That's God calling us, wanting us to live for him. So I'll tell you, the best life possible is to be part of what God is doing in the world. But don't misunderstand. Let me tell you this as well. The most difficult life possible is to be part of what God's doing in the world. Yeah. We're learning this through a man named Nehemiah. Nehemiah lived over 400 years before Christ was born into the world. Nehemiah uh, was uh, working for the king of Persia. He was a butler, so to speak, a cupbearer who had to test the wine before giving it to the king. He heard that his homeland, Jerusalem, the city of the temple and the city of the people of God, well, the walls were still in ruins after they, it was destroyed and burned 140 years earlier by Israel's enemy, the Babylonians. And when he heard that the walls were still rubble and that his people were living in disgrace and they wondered, where is God? Are we even his people anymore? Nehemiah was cut to the heart. He knew something had to be done and he responded to the Lord. And so we've been looking at this story of Nehemiah. And what you're going to learn today is that as he led the people, the charge to rebuild the walls, there was a lot of opposition. And he had to learn how to resist and to break through. You see, we have to resist because whenever you partner with God, opposition shows up. You need to understand that. My first call out of the seminary was to a church in Los Angeles area. It was Inglewood, California, right next to the L.A. airport. It was a difficult place. There were bars on the windows of people's homes. They had heavy metal doors in the front. I learned the first Christmas Eve, you don't have a Christmas Eve service because nobody will come. They're all at home guarding the gifts that they bought for fear that someone would break into their home and steal it. Crime and gang violence were all around. Death, shootings. It was a tough time. 
The racial divide was at a boiling point. If you've ever heard of the Watts riots, it was just right down the road from us. I thought, as a naive young pastor, all I have to do is go in that church, preach a few sermons. It's going to get everybody excited. We're going to be united, and we'll be on the path to growth, man. <laughs> Didn't exactly happen that way. While I was there, I was told to get out. They didn't want me there. I used to get hate phone calls. It seemed to always be on Saturday night when I'm trying to prepare my sermon for the next day. I had one woman tell me, I know people who can put you away. She wasn't talking about a nursing home. And I believed her. I'll never forget I got to one point. By the way, all those people were members of the church. And I got to a point where I just went into the church. I laid down in front of the altar, and I just cried out to God. I said, God, what am I doing here? But I'll tell you, God used that to teach me something, to teach me not to worry about what other people think, to teach me to keep my eyes on him, to teach me the reality that whenever you do a work for God, there will be resistance. shouldn't have surprised me. Because it was the Apostle Peter who wrote to the early church, 1 Peter chapter 5. He said, be self-controlled and alert. <clears throat> Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him. Stand firm in the faith because you know that your brothers throughout the world are undergoing the same kind of sufferings. Peter was saying, don't let that surprise you. After all, look how the world responded to Jesus. They crucified him. There was another apostle who faced a lot of opposition. <laughs> he wrote about it in 2 Corinthians. His name is Paul. Here's what he wrote. He said, I've been in prison, flogged severely, exposed to death again and again. Five times he received from the religious leaders 39 lashes. Three times he was beaten with rods. Once he was stoned and left for dead. He was literally pelted with rocks that people threw at him to kill him because they hated him. Why? For one reason, one reason only. Because Paul could not stop telling people about Jesus, the Savior of the world. And he was mocked and he was ridiculed. So tell me about your opposition, huh? <laughs> How does it look after hearing about Peter and Paul? I think what we need is a conversation with those two men, and maybe we'll put a little perspective on it for us. And actually, it was Jesus himself that warned us about the reality of a dangerous enemy called the devil. Yes, the devil is real. Demons are real. And here's what Jesus had to say in John chapter 10. He said, the thief, who is the devil, his name, devil, diabolos, means divider, accuser, condemner. The thief comes, to comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. You know, many Christians have the mistaken idea that if you're doing a work for God, he ought to protect you. You shouldn't have to deal with all these obstacles, and nothing could be further from the truth. You see, we don't face opposition because we're doing something wrong. We face opposition because we're doing something right. We want to be partners with God in what he's doing in the world. Nehemiah is a case in point. Let me read from Nehemiah chapter 4, beginning with verse 1. When Sanballat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he became angry and was greatly incensed. He ridiculed the Jews and in the presence of his associates in the army of Samaria, and he said, what are those feeble Jews doing? Will they restore their wall? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they finish in a day? Can they bring the stones back to life from the heaps of rubble, burned as they are? Tobiah the Ammonite, who is at his side, said, What are they building? If even a fox climbed up on it, he would break down their wall of stones. Not too encouraging, is it? They're enemies. And the strategies of the enemy includes things like people who will oppose you when you're trying to do what's right. 
You have any sand ballots in your life? People who kind of downplay it, maybe a coworker, maybe a relative are saying, why are you trying to do these things? Why are you living this life of faith that way? Why don't you just go along with everything like everybody else? There's always going to be those who oppose us. There will be obstacles that we'll face in the circumstances of life. Listen, anything that you do worthwhile, you're going to have obstacles. If you start a new business, guess what? It's hard to break through. You're going to have obstacles. Most people don't make it. When you plant a new church, guess what? There's obstacles. When you try to revitalize a church, there's obstacles. Sometimes it comes from people who first, on the one hand, they say, well, we've never done it that way before. <laughs> you know, change is a fearful thing for many. On the other hand, you have people who say, well, we've tried that before. It didn't work. And so you get this opposition, and you can get criticism from others, and that criticism can begin to just chip away at your commitment and your confidence in God. And here's what I'll tell you. This is the time to resist. You not only need to be part of what God's doing to reclaim what was lost and rebuild what was broken, we have to learn how to resist if we're ever going to break through and see God's will accomplished. How do you resist? Well, let me continue with Nehemiah chapter 4. After, after the Sanballat and his other enemies were speaking against him and mocking him, here's what Nehemiah had to say. Hear us, O our God, for we are despised. Turn their insults back on their own heads. Give them over as plunder in the land of captivity. Do not cover up their guilt or blot out their sins from your sight, for they have thrown insults in the face of the builders. So we rebuilt the wall till all of it reached half its height, for the people worked with all their heart. But when Sanballat, Tobiah, the Arabs, the Ammonites, the men of Ashdod heard that the, about the repairs to Jerusalem's walls had gone ahead and that the gaps were being closed, they were very angry. And they all plotted to come and fight against Jerusalem and stir up trouble against it. But we prayed to our God and posted a guard day and night to meet this threat. I want you to notice, Nehemiah didn't just complain. He, just didn't, he didn't sit around and go, they're just too mean. We can't do this. <laughs> no. And he didn't fool himself that, well, maybe if I just explain it to everybody, they'll understand my good intentions. Listen, sometimes you have an enemy that just wants to destroy you. Maybe they think you're going to get ahead of them. Maybe their view of life is really out of the scarcity mindset that says, well, if you're ahead, that means I'm behind. And this might be what's going on here. But did you notice the two things that Nehemiah did? He took it to God in prayer, and then he got back to work. So how do you resist in the face of opposition doing what God wants you to do? Well, take it to God in prayer. Pray about it. I'm telling you, when you pray, you get what God can do. When you work, you get what you can do. So pray about it. And then get back to work. Don't worry about what people think. The goal in life is not to have people like you. Did you know that? That was the Achilles heel of what God was dealing with me in my first call. He thought, let's deal with this now. I happened to be a people pleaser back then, and I discovered that half the congregation, which was only 50 people, by the way, half of them hated my guts before I even got there. I was the wrong color. I was the wrong culture. And I had to learn that all that really matters is what God thinks of me and to keep my eyes on him. Listen to me. You answer to God regarding your life, not to anybody else. And so live your life for an audience of one. Live it to the Lord your God. The reality, I'll stand before him one day. And I don't want to say to him, you know, I was going to do what you told me, but man, people weren't very nice. I, I decided to take it easy. Go back to that porch. Remember the last week, the porch? That's where I want to be. Smoke my cigar once a year. But no, we are to keep our eyes on him. Be careful of the discouragement that can come against you. 
Listen again to Nehemiah chapter 4. I go on with verse 10. Meanwhile, the people in Judah said, The strength of the laborers is giving out. There is so much rubble that we cannot rebuild the wall. And our enemies said, Before they know it or see us, we will be right there among them and will kill them and put an end to the work. <laughs> then the Jews who lived near them came and told us ten times over, Whenever, Wherever you turn, they will attack us discouragement always in the face of opposition it can come it can happen have you ever dealt with that if you had to fight against discouragement maybe you say to yourself well who am i how can i possibly make a difference i'm a stay-at-home mom what can i do i'm a student at school how can i make a difference in the world i'm uh, too old the other day I had to mark something with the age categories and for the first time I was in the last category. That's kind of an eye opener right there. But you know what I'm learning? God can use older guys too and women. Or maybe you'll say I'm too young or I don't have enough know-how. You got to remember this isn't about you. This is about God working through you. You can let that discouragement overwhelm you if you're not careful. So how do you respond to this? And now, listen to what Nehemiah had to say. In addition to take it to God in prayer and get back to work, here's what he had to say. Nehemiah 4, verse 13. Therefore I stationed some of the people behind the lowest points of the wall at the exposed places, posting them by families with swords, spears, and bows. Don't you like that? He posted them there. And so then he said to them, after I looked things over, I stood up and I said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your home. I love that because Nehemiah knew what was at stake here. These are the people of God chosen to be the ones who would usher into the world God's presence. And that happened through Jesus, born of the Jews. And he said, you've got to remember the Lord. That's what we need to do. Remember his greatness and his goodness to work in times when we can't even have the strength to do anything. He's there. And don't despise the small steps of moving forward. I want to tell you what a joy it's been for me to confirm three students last week. And I got to confirm three students in September. Baptism today. We have about four baptisms in less than a two-month time period. And we have new members today. Six new members who said, we want to be part of what God's doing in this family of God. Don't you ever despise the progress and steps that God makes. But you give him praise and watch and see what he'll do. Don't be overcome. Remember the Lord, how good and great he is. And then fight for your cause. I love that. He said, I posted them with swords. There were half of them, they were defending the others. They were doing the work. You had those willing to fight the enemy. So make no mistake about it. There will be a fight. You can't delegate that. By the mere fact that you're a child of God, you have a target on your back. You need to be able to then, with the strength that God gives you, resist and fight the fight. Let me ask you, what are you fighting for? Have you discovered that one thing God's called you to do? Have you had your Popeye moment? Remember that? And Popeye said, that's all I can stand. I can't stand no more. And he took action. What is God calling you to do? You're going to fight for the unborn? Are you going to fight for the poor? Are you going to fight for kids who, for whatever reason, are already so disadvantaged in life? How are they ever going to make it? Are you going to fight for the hungry? Are you going to fight for the next generation, that they grow up in the knowledge of Christ? Are you going to fight for your marriage? Are you going to fight for your kids? Who are you going to fight for? Are you going to fight for your church? We need to get back to the fight of what God calls us to do. And when you do that, just watch what 
will happen. Because here's what I can tell you. When you fight for what God calls you to do, God himself will fight for you. <laughs> and he can do far more than we can think or imagine. Listen to the outcome now in Nehemiah chapter 6. With all the opposition as he resisted, listen to what happened. So the wall was completed on the 25th of Elul in 52 days. When all our enemies heard about this, all the surrounding nations were afraid and lost their confidence because they realized that this work had been done with the help of our God. <laughs> Don't you love that? 52 days, they rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem. I'm going to tell you, it's only when you resist through the power of Christ that you'll have breakthrough to see God's work accomplished. Remember that first call that I had in Inglewood, California? After I laid down in front of the altar and I said, God, what am I doing here? It wasn't long after that that I received an inquiry to be an associate pastor at a church that was amazing. This is a church in Orange, California, a huge church. Matter of fact, they had a large school and they needed to expand their school. And guess what? The uh, elementary school across the street came up for sale. They paid cash for that elementary school. And I thought, if they ever call me to be their associate pastor, I'm gone. I'm going. <laughs> okay? That's what I thought. And I'm so glad Sue hung in there with me during all this time. But I, I said, I will go. And guess what? It happened. I got the phone call. And here's what I imagined. I would imagine that after they told me that I had the call, I would take the receiver and put it down. Let me explain to you young people. It used to be that we didn't have cell phones, okay? That you actually had a receiver with a cord on it that went to a telephone, and you would actually have to put it down, okay? So I imagined that I would have that receiver in my, and they would tell me, We've called you, Pastor, to be our associate pastor. Here's what I pictured. I would put that down, and I would do a happy dance all over the place in our apartment until soon. I said, we're going. We're out of here. I can't wait. I got the phone call. Pastor, we want you to be our pastor, our associate pastor. We're extending the call to you. And I'm trying to be very appropriate on the phone, you know, not go too wild. I said, this is a real honor, and I will pray about it and get back to you as soon as possible. Here's what happened. Began to put down the receiver. And I go, oh, no. God, you're not going to let me leave. I didn't hear words, okay? I understand that. This is in my mind. But the question was this, how many disciples have you made where you are? Oh, but God, I've preached a lot of sermons. I've taught a lot of Bible classes. What do you mean? How many disciples have you made? I turned down that call. I thought I'd never be heard from again. <laughs> And Sue and I, I'm so glad she didn't leave me at that point. We picked one couple. We said, would you meet with us for Bible study and prayer? And we did it on Friday night. It's called discipleship. And we shared our lives. We prayed for each other. I could tell you story after story, but don't have time. And then... They were so excited, church people started asking, well, wh why are you so excited? What's going on? They said, oh, we're having Bible study and prayer with Pastor John and Sue. And one lady said, what? That's not in the bulletin? <laughs> Out of that, we started two more groups. And do you know, in the next two years, we doubled in size. They doubled my salary, which isn't saying much. They weren't paying me very much. But they doubled my salary. There was hope. God worked in ways I never dreamed, and I would have missed it if I had not resisted the opposition. How about you, Somerset Hills Lutheran Church? Where do we need to finish what's been started? Where do we need to fight for what God's doing in this place? Where do we need to remember that He is God?
and he can do more than we can think or imagine. How about it? Will you resist? Resist the discouragement. Resist the criticisms. Will you take it to God in prayer and get back to work? God grant it for Jesus' sake. Amen. So it is a great joy and pleasure at this time that we're going to receive those who are officially becoming members of uh, Somerset Hills Lutheran Church. And I invite you who are here to come forward. We'll just stand in the front of the church. Just kind of spread out. I'll stand back here so we'll stay appropriately distanced. <laughs> Praise God. Hallelujah. I want to tell you what a joy this is because we're doing this journey together and God is working in your life, but hear me, he's not done. He's got so much in store for you. He loves you so much. And there's a church here, and that church, I'm telling you, you praise God for these new brothers and sisters, okay? They're coming in our midst and some of them have been with us for a while, but they have taken this step to be official. And isn't that awesome? So I'm going to give you opportunity to uh, share your faith and your desire to be part of this church. So I now ask you, do you believe in God the Father, creator of heaven and earth? Then answer, yes, I believe in God the Father. Amen. Do you believe in God the Son, Jesus Christ, as your Savior from sin and eternal death? Then answer, yes, I believe in God the Son. And do you believe in God the Holy Spirit who gives you faith and empowers you to live as a follower of Jesus? Then answer, yes, I believe in God the Holy Spirit. Do you believe that the Bible, the Scriptures, are the inspired Word of God? If so, answer, I do. And do you desire to be a member of Somerset Hills Lutheran Church? Then answer, I do. You've made a public profession of faith. Do you intend to continue in the promise that God has made with you in holy baptism to live among God's people faithfully, to hear his word and share it in his holy supper, to proclaim good news of Jesus Christ through the things you do and the things you say, to serve others as you're able to do with your gifts, following our Lord's humble example, and to support the work of the church with your gifts and prayers to the best of your ability? If so, answer, I do, and I ask God to help and guide me. May God richly bless you in this, and on behalf of Somerset Hills Lutheran Church, I welcome you to the family of God in this place and look forward to all that God will do. Dear, yes. Dear Somerset Hills, family of God, will you do all you can to encourage these brothers and sisters? And will you pray for them? And will you be partners with them in the work of the Lord? If so, answer, we will with the help of God. Amen. We rejoice. You may go and be seated. I would hug you if we didn't have the COVID thing going on, but uh, God richly bless you. Thank you. We turn to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we give you praise and thanks. We've seen you work in powerful ways already today, but we pray in our daily lives that we'd see you at work and that you would do more than we could think or imagine. I lift up to those who need a touch of your healing hand, Jenny and Joe, Finley and Fred Richards, Hazel and Melanie. Lord, would you put your hand of grace upon them and give them, Lord, in their bodies healing but also strengthen them in their faith and in their souls. We uh, pray for those who, uh, Lord, are, have bereavement because of loss of a loved one. And so a former church member here, Glenn Heckendorf, at the death of his wife, Connie, we ask for your peace and your comfort to them. 
to him and to his family. Lord, we praise you for birthdays. John Kuna, who celebrates a birthday this week, and give him, Lord, continued strength, and thank you for how he serves you in this place. We pray for our preschool, Lord God, that you continue to bless us. Thank you for new families that are registering, and Lord, for the opportunity to show love to the children as well as to their parents. And Lord, we pray for our nation and our government leaders that you would uh, give wisdom from above, that you would guide us, that you would humble us, that indeed we would remember to pray for our nation, which has experienced so much turmoil, so much difficulty. But let us who, who have the name of Jesus, let us be a light that shines, that others may see that you indeed are real and you love them. Now as a family of God in this place, we pray for what has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We now experience the reality and love of our God through something that also looks very simple. It is through bread and wine. Jesus said that he gives himself to us through these common elements. You see, in the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord took bread, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take eat, this is my body, which is given for you. After the supper, he took the cup, and when he had supped, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the new covenant shed in my blood for the remission of all your sins. Do this as often as you drink it, remembering me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Let us then together as a family of God, we take the uh, kits and open up the bread side first, please. And then you take the bread, take and eat the body of Christ broken into death for you. Taking the cup, take and drink the true blood of Christ shed for you for the forgiveness of all your sins. <clears throat> now may this, the true body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, strengthen and preserve you in true faith unto life everlasting. Amen. Receive then the blessing of our God. And may I say, these are not just words. God, the Spirit, works through the Word. I want you to receive this blessing in your heart and your mind. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and grant you peace, now and always. Amen. We close with the final hymn. Sing.
serve the Lord. Amen.